want to recap briefly, you should have some detailed notes for the women of Exodus. And I had briefly mentioned a few of the men of Exodus, and I've decided that I'm going to make Caleb a question on the test, and Eleazar I'm going to add to the test as well. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the men of Exodus and talk about the last part of the journey from Egypt to the Promised Land. So first off, when we get to Mount Sinai, Moses is up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments from God, receiving all of the other laws from God. And there's an incident that takes place in chapter 32 that's pretty famous in all the movies, but worth a closer look at the actual biblical text. So Moses is up on the mountain. In verse 1, the people come to Aaron and they say, Make us a God who will go before us. We're not sure what's happened to that Moses fellow. Aaron replies, Take off the golden earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. By the way, this is the gold they brought with them from Egypt. So Aaron received their offering and fashioning it with a tool, made a molten calf. And then they cried out, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Aaron then builds an altar, and the people begin offering holocausts and having a big celebration. In the meantime, Moses gets word from God up on the mountain that things are not going well back down in the camp. So Moses asks God to protect the people. Very interesting, verse 10, God says, Let me alone that my, anger may burn, that my anger may burn against them to consume them. Then I will make you a great nation. God basically says, let me just nuke these people and I'll take care of you. And then Moses says, no, 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 no. You know, you got to take care of the people. Otherwise, the Egyptians are just going to laugh at you. What kind of God are you? So Moses comes down the mountain. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when he gets to the camp, he himself flies into a bit of a rage and he takes the tablets that he's just received and throws them down and breaks them. He has to go get a set, a set later on. And then he takes their golden calf, melts it, grinds it up into dust, which he then puts in the water and makes the people drink. And he turns to Aaron and says, What did this people do to you? that you should lead them into so grave a sin. Aaron replies, Don't let my Lord be angry. You know how the people are prone to evil. They said to me, Make us a God to go before us. As for this man Moses, who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has happened to him. So I told them, Whoever is wearing gold, take it off. They gave it to me. I threw it into the fire, and this calf came out. Just let that sink in for a minute, that... Aaron seems to tell a big fat lie. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Moses goes into a rage and he says, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites, all the people of his tribe, come to them. And he says, Great, pick up your swords and go around and kill all the people who worshipped the golden calf. And that day about 3,000 people die, except for Aaron. Verse 29, Then Moses said, Today you are installed as priests for the Lord, for you went against your own sons and brothers to bring a blessing upon yourselves this day. So the tribe of Levi is now going to be the priest for Israel, in charge of all the carrying the holy vestments, doing the holocaust, receiving a portion of all the holocaust, and it's their reward for committing or killing all the people who worship the golden calf. Ironically, soon after this, Aaron is made the high priest. He's made essentially the ancient Israelite pope. And there's a little problem with the story, and I'll try to talk about it in class later, but a little peek at Aaron's own um, personality and kind of Mr. Teflon, he does this horrible thing and nothing bad happens to him, and in fact he gets promoted. Speaking of which, apparently Miriam and Aaron were jealous of the fact that God spoke through Moses. 
and they decided to harp on Moses being married to a Midianite woman or a Cushite woman, Zipporah. And so they complained to God, is it only through Moses that you're going to speak? And in the story, God gets mad at Miriam and Aaron. And when the cloud comes down upon the meeting tent and then pulls away, it turns out that Miriam is struck with a scaly infection, what would be called leprosy in some of the uh, biblical texts. And Aaron is obviously upset by this. And in verse 13, Moses cries out and asks God to take care of Miriam. And God's response is, well, suppose her father had spit in her face. Wouldn't she bear her shame for seven days? And so Miriam is forced to be shut outside of the tent, or outside of the uh, camp for the next seven days as punishment for rebelling against Moses. And nothing happens to Aaron. So just let that sink in again. Aaron's this flawed character. He's had some uh, conflict with Moses. He's done some things wrong and hasn't really suffered any repercussions for them. Uh, there is one more mention of Miriam in the Bible. It comes later in the book of Numbers that she dies as the Israelites are wandering around the wilderness on their way to the Promised Land, and she is buried. So that puts her to rest. Going to go back to the map for a moment. The Israelites depart from Egypt they head out into the wilderness, Mount Sinai. They are eating bug secretions and birds that are dropping out of the sky, and they're finding water and rocks and all kind of, kinds of miraculous things. And they're going to be at Mount Sinai for over a year, receiving the covenant from God, receiving all the laws and rules and regulations. And then they're going to head to the Promised Land. And it's actually going to take them 40 years to get there. They're going to end up wandering through the desert before they get to the promised land. So here I'll pick up a theme from last semester. Jacob's name was changed to Israel after he wrestled with an angel. And the name Israel means wrestles with God. And here I want to pull out a theme that comes up over and over and over in the books of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, where the Israelites experience all these great things like the ten plagues on the Egyptians and as soon as they get out of Egypt verse 11 they start complaining to Moses you know why did you bring us out of Egypt you know we wanted to stay and serve the Egyptians we liked being slaves and then God works the miracle at the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeds and in chapter 15 they arrive at Mara and the people grumble verse 24 against Moses saying, what are we going to drink? <clears throat> Moses fixes the water, and we turn to chapter 16, and now the Israelites are grumbling against Moses because they had great food back in Egypt, and now they've got nothing. So God sends manna from heaven. And then we jump to chapter 17, and the people are thirsty again. They want some water. And Moses goes up to a rock, and he strikes it with his staff, and water comes gushing out of it. Turns out there are some natural reservoirs in the shale, the porous shale rock, so it is possible to get some water out of rocks. But again, let's take this just miraculously. Every time they complain, God does something for them, and then they complain about something else. This continues in Numbers chapter 11. When the Israelites finally leave Mount Sinai, the riffraff among them were so greedy for meat that even the Israelites lamented again. If only we had meat. You know, we miss, we miss all the onions and the garlic and the melons. All we have is this bread from heaven. All we have is this, you know, sweet little bug secretions that we're picking up. And in chapter 11, there's kind of a poetic justice a wind arises that drives in quail from the sea and leaves them all around the camp at a depth of two cubits from the ground. So the birds are only um, in the first three feet off the ground. So all that day and all that next night, the people set about to gather the quail, and even those who gathered the least gathered ten homers of them, which is a lot of quail. 
But then, while the meat was still between their teeth, before it could be chewed, the Lord's wrath flared up against the people, and the Lord struck them with a great plague. So that place was named Kibroth Hata'ava, because it was here the greedy people were buried. Interesting footnote in the older translation of our Bible, it disappeared this year. Um, apparently, quail migrate across the Gulf of Aqaba and towards the Mediterranean, traveling east and west, depending on the time of year. And so the fact that a bunch of quail could be driven in by a windstorm and easily pick, be picked up is actually something that still happens today. Um, these little fat birds that just kind of land in front of you and you can pick them up and eat them. But of course, if you start eating too much meat and it spoils, then you're going to die. Uh, again, the stories of people complaining against Moses and complaining against God appear over and over in the book of Numbers. Uh, one of the most famous ones in Numbers chapter 21 the Israelites set out, and they're complaining against Moses, and God sends serpents which bite the people, and many of the people die. And so Moses makes a bronze serpent, holds it up on a pole, and then the people look at it, and they get better. Uh, could be the origin of the medical symbol that is a snake on a pole, which emerged out of Africa for people who treated guinea worms. And... That's worth looking up on your own time if you ever have the chance. So it might be really easy to just kind of point our fingers and say, what kind of people are these that all these great things happen for them and they complain? Um, God does all these great things for them and they complain about what they don't have. And instead of getting into the habit of taking these stories and saying, you know, what were these people thinking? What idiots are they? It's useful for us to take these stories and say, in what ways are we Israel? In what ways do we struggle with God? What are all the good things that happen for us? And all we do is complain about the things we wish we had more of. So again, not so much to point back at them and say, what are they thinking? But maybe use it as a chance to be more self-reflective. Reflective. Speaking of complaining... Moses decides to send 12 men to scout, to reconnoiter the land of Canaan. And they send them out into uh, the land, check it out, and they come back 40 days later, and the report is basically, this is a great place, land of milk and honey, wonderful land, but the people who live there, they're fierce, and they will kick our butts. The only people who are actually supportive of the um, chant, uh, the opportunity to take over the promised land are Caleb and Joshua who are suggesting to the people that God will be with them. The reaction of the people, as you might expect, is that they're going to grumble and complain with Moses and in verse 4 here they even suggest let's appoint a leader and go back to Egypt. Let's go back and see if we can get our old jobs back as slaves. While Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who are the only ones who are encouraging the people to go into the promised land. At this point, God really decides he wants to nuke the Israelites, and Moses actually begs God to save them, and God gives in. He says, all right, all right, I pardon them as you have asked, yet by my life and the Lord's glory that fills the earth, of all the people who have seen my glory in the signs I did in Egypt, no one gets to go to the promised land except for Caleb and Joshua, the two scouts who were on my side. But for those of you who exited Egypt, those of you who have been complaining for the past 40 years, none of you get to go. You're going to die here in the wilderness. Your children are going to wander for 40 years and they will be the ones to enter the promised land. Uh, and it turns out that not even Moses and Aaron will get to go, but we'll talk about that later. 